Every segmented bowl project I have starts with a computer program which I use to design the bowl itself and it also helps me to generate a cutting list and individual drawings of the rings and uh, pieces that I'm going to have to make. I start my segmented bowls with the foot or the bottom of the bowl. Here I'm rough tracing out the outline of one of the feet on a piece of bloodwood. It's a little bit oversized at this point. I use the bandsaw to rough cut the final bowl bottom or foot to shape. It doesn't have to be perfectly round at this point. Uh, that's what the lathe is for. You might have noticed there are two feet being cut in this. That's because I'm actually making two bowls. Each of the individual rings is made up of very precisely cut sticks of wood. Here I'm straightening one edge of a large piece of maple to get ready to be made into a strip. Using the table saw, I cut it to the desired width according to the cut list. Each of the individual pieces of wood are a very specific width and a very specific thickness. Here I am planing, getting them to a typical thickness. Uh, for my bowls, I generally run segments that are three-quarter inch, half inch, or a quarter inch thick. And uh, they have to be very precise. These will make up the individual rings as I cut them down to length uh, a bit later in the process. Here's the process parts pile of all of the pieces required to make two complete 13 inch segmented bowls. Each ring will be made up of an individual species or a combination of species. You can see here they're called rows, but they actually be the rings. They get cut down later. I mentioned that I start with the foot as the primary piece for my segmented poles, and that's because it uh, forms the foundation and all the other rings stack up and make the body of the bowl. Here I'm gluing one of those cut feet that I pre-processed on the bandsaw to a glue block, which is mounted on a faceplate right on the lathe. Um, my intention here is to get this thing glued on so that I can do the processing I have to do on it to make it the foot of the bowl. Here you can see me getting ready to drill out what's going to become a mortise that'll hold the bowl to the chuck and actually uh, will become part of the decoration for the bottom of the foot itself. Uh, normally I turn these things with regular turning tools, but uh, I had a large Forstner bit around, never tried it, thought I'd experiment it and see if it made the process any easier. But uh, it went pretty good. Here I'm adding some decoration to the bottom of the bowl with a uh, specialized tool that cuts beads nicely into the bottom just just purely decoration and uh, it adds a nice little touch here i'm grabbing a little teardrop shaped tool to refine those beads and also to cut a little groove in the bottom and i can see the line i've drawn on there that's the actual four inch diameter that the bottom of the bowl is actually going to be i mentioned when i cut it on the bandsaw i cut it oversized uh, that's to give me a little room for error and if I decide I want to change and make it a little bigger or whatever. But when I'm to this point, I'm ready to get it down to regular size. And I'm using a carbide tool here. Normally I use regular high-speed steel um, gouges and stuff that uh, uh, regular wood turners would use. But this blood wood is as hard as a rock and every 15 seconds I was sharpening my tool. So I ended up going to the carbide. Carbide looked pretty good. Did a nice job. And here I'm parting off the finished foot from the glue block. Uh, normally I would just turn these things off and uh, catch them with my hand, but you'll see in a second here I'm going to grab a saw and do the final cut just for safety so it wouldn't fly off the lathe. Although that wood was so hard, probably could have bounced it off a concrete wall and wouldn't hurt it, but this was a safer, easier way to do it. Now I'm getting ready to cut the segments. You see I've got a customized sled that I've built in a stop system. It's highly precise. These things have to be incredibly precise so there aren't any gaps when you glue them together. Uh, 
this particular ring that I'm making is going to be uh, a combination of maple and bloodwood. You can see I'm cutting the maple right now. And it's going to be 24 segments recorded for this ring. And I'm also going to have some spacers. You can see I'm just finishing up with the maple here. And there's all kinds of marks uh, on the wood. And that's actually, it has a purpose. I uh, use those marks later when I'm gluing it up to uh, orient the ring so I keep them in a spe uh, specific sequence. Here's the bloodwood. I'll be cutting 12 segments of bloodwood. Uh, again, the sled is highly precise and really lets me cut these things perfect. I'll give you a back view here in a second so you can see over my shoulder. There's another thing that uh, piece that I created that helps. If you look over by the saw blade, you'll see a little ramp to the right side where the pieces fall off. That ramp keeps the pieces from catching back on the saw blade and being flung back at me. Uh, don't ask how uh, I know that that's what happens. Okay, we're finally getting to the meat and potatoes of the uh, process here. Where we're actually gluing the individual segments into rings. And here you can see I'm using a really large hose clamp. I've got a bunch of these. This one happens to be 12 inches. I've got hose clamps up to 16 inches for helping me keep these rings glued and clamped tight. Uh, this is the uh, bloodwood and maple that you saw me cutting on the table saw earlier. I'm also putting in a quarter inch spacer between each segment. Uh, the, that piece is made out of wangi. Uh, so this particular ring, I'm speeding it up here a little bit, this particular ring is actually going to be 48 segments. Uh, there's 24 segments of wangi, and then there's 12 segments of maple and 12 segments of bloodwood. It's a long, laborious process. I'm using a slow setting glue. Uh, if I used regular wood glue with these uh, big segmented uh, rings, uh, they'd start to set up before I got done. So I found some slow setting glue, and that really makes it a lot easier. Here I'm conforming the pieces to the ring, uh, getting it ready to be tightened. It has to be perfectly aligned and you want it as square as possible. Uh, the more work you can do here now, the less work you have to do after the glue is dried. And you'll see that I'm wiping off the top of the ring and I'm getting get ready to uh, tap it down. Uh, if I keep it as flat as possible at this stage before the glue dries, I have a lot less sanding to do to get it perfectly flat in the next step. So this is the process I go through for each ring. There's nine rings on this bowl. Here I'm getting ready to tighten it up. You want it tight enough so that it's snug and all the joints are perfectly, perfectly square. You just don't want it so tight that it uh, squeezes all the glue out. Individual rings have to be dead flat on both sides, or when they stack together, there'll be gaps. Uh, in order to get them dead flat, I'm lucky enough to have a drum sander, and that's what I use. You can see me putting chalk on the top of some of these rings. You can see other rings in that red cart in the back. The idea of the chalk is, once the chalk is gone, after it's been sanded off, I know the ring is flat. So I'm running through now. You can still see there's some chalk on there. In a second, I'm going to reach over and right there, lower the drum just a couple thousands. I keep running it through. I just keep going back and forth and back and forth until the chalk is gone on one side and then I flip them over and do the same process on the other. When the chalk is gone on both sides of the rings, they're absolutely perfectly flat and when you stack them together there are no gaps or cracks or anything. They're perfect and that's what you're looking for with a segmented ball. Here you can see some of the other rings, uh, colored rings, and here's some of the wingy quarter inch rings that I use on the feature ring. The feature ring is the one that has a uh, multi-species and a little more decorative. These are quarter inch, and you can see the white chalk on the black wingy because I couldn't see some of the other colors. Same process. Okay, now we're going to glue up all of the flattened rings and uh, start to make an actual bowl. You see a custom jig that I made there with the concentric rings. That helps me center the individual rings as I prepare to glue them. I use the tape kind of as a clamp. It's a quick clamp and I don't have to use anything heavy mechanical. And I'm using that little spatula so that I get a real tight corner when I press them in so the rings don't uh, move around when I pick that, uh, that jig up. So see I put it on four sides. It works pretty good. It, uh, it's better than uh, going to metal clamps and there really aren't any metal clamps or anything that I found that would work, so the tape is doing the job. And I, you can center it pretty well just by eye. They don't have to be perfect. You're going to turn them around on the lathe anyway. If they're a little off, it isn't going to make any difference. Now I'm getting ready to take it to the lathe. And you can see the foot and one of the rings already glued together, and it's mounted on the chuck on the lathe. I'm bringing up my template, 
up against the ring that's already glued and I'm making a pencil line on the new ring and that'll tell me where I need glue. Uh, there's no sense putting glue on the entire ring when I only need a little bit of an area to glue it to that colored ring underneath it. So once I've got that line, I know where the glue, uh, outer limits of that is, and I take it back to the bench and I apply glue to the inside. You can see, uh, in this case, I'm using a little faster setting glue because uh, I want the rings to dry quickly. I don't want them to take real long. Uh, it still takes six or eight hours, but it's, uh, it's not like overnight. And here I'm kind of evening out the glue. It doesn't have to be pretty. Uh, it's just that, you know, no sense gluing the whole thing, the whole, you know, just a waste of glue and uh, it just makes a mess. So I'll go back to the lathe after I got the glue on. I'll put it back on. I'll bring it up tight against the ring that's already glued and I'll kind of mush them together so that I get uh, glue spread on both rings. Now the idea when you're gluing these rings together is you want you don't want the joints to line up. So it's kind of like laying bricks. You, uh, you, you space the gaps of the ring, the next ring up into the uh, body of the ring below so that it's uh, always alternating. It's kind of hard to see in this particular picture, but the ring, the lines are uh, from the ring above are actually uh, on the one below. Here I'm starting to turn those first couple rings that I've glued on. Uh, you could glue them all, all the rings on at once and do it, and I've done and uh, turn them at once. I've done that. Uh, I actually prefer this. It, it's a little more time consuming. You got to wait a little bit more for glue and different pieces to dry. But I'm using conventional turning tools here. I start with my uh, bowl gouger. I'm using a bowl gouge and I shear scrape. And uh, I use a, a regular scraper, uh, standard high speed steel lathe tools. I really like the scraper. It does a nice job on this side grain on these, uh, on these particular rings. And you can see I'm starting to make it look a little bit like a bottom of a bowl. And uh, you can see how nice and tight those uh, gaps are, cracks. That was, because of that high precision jig and taking time gluing them. Here I'm doing the inside of the bowl, same thing. Uh, high speed steel bowl gouge and, uh, and then I'll en end up using a scraper here to make it nice and smooth. And when that's done, I'm gonna just glue on more rings, same way as before. You can start to see I've already gone through the process a little bit. You can see how the glue lines, uh, or the glue lines up, the, the gaps are staggered, like I said, like laying bricks. And you can see the feature ring is in place and the two quarter inch wangy rings surrounding that uh, 48 ring uh, piece that we made earlier that we were gluing up. So here I'm turning again, just continuing to glue and glue a few and tur turn a few and I'm using a bowl gouge here just to roughly get its shape. And then I'll, I'll go to my scraper again to smooth it out and, and get it, uh, get a real nice finish on it. And again, I'm back on the inside, start with the bowl gouge, uh, get it close. Uh, you'll see me uh, it would take my hand and, and kind of squeeze the bowl and feel uh, on the outside and the inside. That's because I'm, I'm looking for ridges and I'm also trying to make sure that the width of the bowl wall is consistent throughout the entire bowl. So that's why I'm kind of stopping every now and then and feeling the sides of the bowl. Get rid of the ridges and make sure it's consistent. And here I go with the scraper, evening it out. You can see it's starting to, starting to look like a bowl. Okay, the bowl is completely turned now and I've got it sanded to about 600 grit and it's ready for finish. Actually looks like a bowl. Okay, time to make it pretty. Uh, I've already got a coat of oil on it now, so I tend to use a bunch of different products when I'm uh, making these segmented bowls, depending on the look I'm going for. This one I wanted a little shinier. I'm using a product called Antique Oil. It's a Minwax product, and uh, I like it. It gives a, a higher gloss finish, which I like on segmented bowls. Normally, I'll finish these bowls right on the lathe, but uh, since I had another bowl to build, I decided to do this one on a bench while I was working on the other bowl on a lathe. Okay, well, if you made it this far, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Uh, this is the finished product. Uh, Bloodwood Maple and Wendy Segmented Bowl. Uh, there's actually two of them, so uh, this is one of two. Appreciate it. Thank you.